And as is our custom, and Martha knows, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not really going to um, say that much about her, ex except to say that, you know, she was the former uh, party chairperson for Wisconsin and the architect of their successful model, which was even successful two weeks ago when they just had spring elections. And again, uh, the Democrats did uh, remarkably well. So I will stop sharing and turn it over to Martha. Okay. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, can everybody see my screen, the span and the picture? Okay. So I'm going to go through this pretty quick because I want to give you the highlights, and then I want to leave time for you to ask questions because I want to really get to what you're concerned about. So to introduce myself here, oh, if it'll let me, why isn't that letting me move forward? There we go. To introduce myself, so how did I get into politics? I was actually in business, worked for a couple of Fortune 500s, and I've also worked in community development, but I was horrified by what Scott Walker was doing to our public school system. So I decided to run thinking that I could win my district. They asked me to close a two point spread, I did 7% better than the top of the ticket. And the day after the election, I learned that I lost by 20%. And I immediately said, what just happened? Like I took a whole year of my life full time, put it into this, did 7% better than the top of the ticket. How did I not win? And so I started digging in. Here is my district, my little Senate district. Each one of these lines represents a candidate. There are Republicans and Democrats, everybody on here. And it's over the different counties that I would represent or if I had won. These are the Republicans and these are the Democrats. So immediate, this was my aha moment going, okay, this is a problem. Like why is Democrats so all over the place? Those two top lines, that's Barack Obama. His, he does that well, but the Democratic Party was comparing, comparing me to, to Barack Obama. And that's not a good comparison, right? And so I immediately started traveling around the state of Wisconsin and saying, we got to change things because Scott Walker is destroying Wisconsin. And so we started looking at a lot of data and I'm really going to race through this. This took a lot of time, but one of the key things, this purplish line, it's supposed to be blue, but it looks purple. That is the Democratic per performance at the time that I was doing this research from 2014. And right away, I'm saying, why are we so up and down, so volatile? Well, the top peaks are presidential and the bottom peaks are midterms, right? So we clearly have something happening there. The second thing that concerned me is the Obama are those two twin peaks right there. That's Obama versus um, when Hillary came in, she didn't get up to that level. Um, and the Republicans have a very bad slope there. Their, ours is flatlined and theirs is going up. So all those things led to concern for me. So I um, did a lot, a deep dive into this and we identified four major issues in Wisconsin. Our brand is damaged because we're not talking in huge areas of our state. So Republicans are defining us. The message isn't resonating. We're talking about issues that aren't really making everyone's lives better. That in my community, we just lost a paper mill. Why aren't you talking about that? And instead you're talking to me about something that doesn't matter to me. There's huge funding disparity. The Republicans have more money than they can dream of and Democrats are scrapping, scraping to try to get money at this time. And then finally, Democrats just aren't voting. Like why aren't Democrats coming out to vote in midterms versus Republicans are just religious voters. They'll show up. So we dug in specifically, we dug into a lot of areas, but I'm only gonna talk about the field program. And these are the big difference in our field program. Barack Obama spent eight to $12 million to build these neighborhood teams. The, the concept that, um, that Jim talked to you about that organizing structure, that was his snowflake bottle, right? And, it, and he built them for eight to 12 million. When Hillary Clinton ran her campaign, she only spent six. And the gubernatorials, they're spending less than two to fight against Scott Walker. So we're just not investing in field programs the same way Brock did, finding one. Finding two was Barack Obama started his and gave himself this huge runway. He started way back in the build year and started building teams. And over time, he was able to build hundreds of teams around Wisconsin versus our gubernatorial and Hillary Clinton's campaign started their field program three to six months before the election, which gave us very little time to connect with volunteers and build the structure we needed. Third point is both the Hillary and the gubernatorials would hire organizers and say, go do this, get volunteers and tell them to make these phone calls, tell them to do this. It's tell them, tell them, tell them, kind of a top down. 
versus Barack Obama built these wonderful neighborhood teams that were empowered. They were trained on how to organize, have somebody who's gonna be making the phone calls to remind people that tomorrow they're expected to come in, have somebody who does the training because they're really good at training, have somebody who is checking people in and giving them their clipboards and getting the turf ready. Everybody had a job and they were an organizing unit very different from the concept of the organizers plan and just assign work out to people. And then finally, field work ends after the election. Barack Obama actually kept his teams working after the election and some of them survived without very much support. And so those were the big findings that I looked at. So what we learned after our full evaluation was that we had to figure out how we were gonna do more with less money. And the Obama model, the snowflake model was key to our organizing. That if we could take volunteers who cost us nothing and put them into you know, action, we could create real change with a lot less money. We wanted to be the resource for candidates and we wanted to build for the future and stop just building for the next election. I often told people when I worked at Target stores that if you asked me to build a, a store by next year, you know, 12 months away versus having our normal five to seven year runway, it's going to cost you a lot more money. And the same thing happens here. So our plan was to have a year round field program. I'm not gonna go into these other ones. My bigger presentation, we had other things, our data integrity and others, but I'm just gonna to jump to the field organizing. And Jim did a great job of describing this to you. So the key is, is that the people that are in the blue in the middle section, they're the paid staff. And each one of those staff members is encouraged to build teams. And when they build teams, they get people that are assigned to the different tasks that a team has to do. Somebody's gonna be my data person. Somebody's going to be my volunteer calling up and reminding people. Somebody's going to cut the turf. Somebody's going to put the clipboards together or now minivan. So everybody has a job. And by splitting the jobs up, you don't overwhelm someone and they burn out as fast. What we found is these people love working together. They're, the lift is light enough because there's so many hands that they enjoy coming together and, and working together and they become a cohesive group. Uh, so we launched our program in February of 2017, right after the disastrous 2016 election. We immediately connected with nine Obama teams that were still in action, had been in action even though they had no support from the Democratic Party. We hired a state organizing director and five regional directors and a constituency outreach director who is going to specifically work on our Latino, Native American, Hmong and Black communities. And we hired a youth director in the summer. Um, we ended up focusing entirely on building new teams. That's what we were on. It was not about how many doors are you doing? How many phone calls are you making? It was about engaging. And they engage with people like the indivisible groups. I, right away, I said, contact every single one that you can find out. We connected with um, Bernie groups. There were a lot of Bernie groups out there that were so angry at the Democratic Party. They wanted nothing to do with us. And I'm like, they don't have to join the party. They don't have to do any of that. Just go have a conversation with them. Talk to them. If they want to do work for what we're doing, this will be the bridge that can bring people back together. We have to heal some wounds here. Um, we worked with environmental groups, with PTOs, anybody who was organizing and caring about our issues, we connected with them. So we powered up gradually, and in 2018, as far as staff goes, we ended 2018 at the election with 99 people in our organizing staff. That's far less than Hillary Clinton had. She had 150 organizers, so we had 33% less organizers. Um, but we had 200 active neighborhood teams by the time the election came along. And the results were phenomenal. So first, with half the money, that we had spent in 2016 on our field program, we did 80% more doors. Those 200 teams that had you know, a whole group of people that were organized to do action, they connected with so many volunteers that we were able to do 80% more doors than we did when we had the other model. I also often tell people that just because a state wins doesn't mean everything they did was great. And just because a state loses doesn't mean everything they did was bad, right? And so when 2018 happened, it was, we barely won. It was by 1%, right? But what we did is we went and we looked at the 752,000 voters that we were targeting with our field program. And we found out that 75% of them voted. That's 2% two and a half percent higher than the statewide average for all registered voters were. And we were targeting the toughest voters for us. So we were 
extremely proud about those results. Um, one other one I'm just going to point out too is the 67 of 72 counties. So our program, our goal was to organize statewide that if there, we may not have a staffer in a particular county, but we would have, we could have volunteer group there. We'd get them literature. We would help them reach out to voters and tell them where not to knock. Um, 67 of our 72 counties increased Democratic votes by 2% or more. And if you added up the 19 reddest counties, Tony Evers would have lost had we not increased voter turnout in those 19 very red counties. One of our counties is one of the reddest in the state, increased um, voter turnout by Democrats by 36%. It was amazing. So the benefits of a year round program, you help down ballot candidates. And if you have volunteers in a community that know how to organize and get out and get your words, get your information out there, we help school board get elected. We help county parties. I also will tell you that it's infectious when these candidates are like, I really have something I can grab onto in my 35% Democratic county. And so we would focus to say, now you should start talking about just winning the school board over, like start filling those spots, win the county party over or the um, county board over. So it's really exciting for down ballot candidates. We were ready for special elections and, cha and challenges. So we had several special elections that came up. We ended up picking up two Senate seats that we later lost, both of them. But because we had this huge network on the ground, we were able to get the boots on the ground and we got turnout at a level that we won those seats for a period of time, which was really exciting for us. And we hope over time we can retain them. Um, we built the Democratic brand. I like to call it Dems in action. So when people are going to, a new school is being put in and they need some help on a, on a playground or something, I, we encourage our teams to go out there and to do um, action in the community. I really want them to get Dems in action t-shirts. <laughs> so it's just like a thing that covers the state that, hey, Democrats are doing. We did have a county that did a phenomenal job at this. Washington County is our second reddest county in the state. And they actually got volunteer of the year award from a county uh, group, even though it is a deep red area, which I said, that changes our brand over time. We're not as ugly. We gotta be pretty good because look at all the kind things we're doing. So it helps us change the narrative the Republicans have given us. And then finally, we're just gonna build stronger communities. When you have Democrats that are speaking up and that we're getting our policies moving forward, it builds a stronger community. Um, so next, where did I go with this? Well, being the chair of the party is kind of like running a relay race. I had run two laps. I needed somebody to take the third lap. So I looked for somebody and Ben Wickler, phenomenal uh, young man who has done an amazing job, took the reins to, to take that on. What I wanted to do was to build a, a donor collaborative where I could connect state parties who wanted to do something like this to build long lasting year in, year out, um, operations that would support candidates in the future. I wanted to connect donors with that. So we launched the state party advancement network called SPAN. And how SPAN works is it is, uh, I am actually paid by a small group of, of donors. So nobody who gives to SPAN gives money to me directly or does it flow through anything. It goes directly to the state parties. I request proposals from the state parties. It's a small group. We had nine states last year that we requested proposals from. I review those proposals. And now this year we added Angel Montez. Is, uh, he was my constituency outreach director in Wisconsin and did a phenomenal job of helping us drive the organizing program and help us get into some of the Latino and Hmong and Native American communities. Um, and Angel is on staff now, he's a SPAN director. He's actually gonna be helping states like Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Florida adopt this program by giving them all of our training materials, providing them, I keep telling them there is no, plagiarism in this role is not a bad thing, plagiarize everything. And so copy it all. And so we're just gonna try to expedite them getting further and giving them a warning them of the things that we learned along the way. Um, donors send their fund, as, as I said, directly to the state parties. And then what I do is I reach in into the states and they have to send us updates. They have to give us metrics. They can't just say, hey, we're going to run a program, but you got to tell us when you're going to hire people by, what are the goals you're going to measure your progress by, how many doors or what kind of actions, how many teams are you going to build and by when. And then we will get that feedback so that we can follow up and see how they're doing. 
sometimes bad things do happen. Sometimes it's just not working and we have to tweak it, but we want to be a part of that and be able to help them tweak it. And then finally, you get all that those updates. So I come back to you and give you the updates and encourage we're trying to build a bigger and bigger donor base so that we can be investing more um, in those. So I just briefly, we gave $5.7 million away last year. We worked with those nine states and some of the big, there's all kinds of great stories I can tell you about, but the field programs, we worked in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan to be sure that they had funding for that. But we also did great things like in North Carolina, they reduced down ballot drop off by 80% for their Supreme Court races, winning those races, which was really important. Um, constituency outreach, Arizona built in uh, 2019 with our funding, started to build their tribal outreach. My favorite story about it is when um, COVID hit, the tribal leaders would not let anybody who is not a tribal member on to tribal lands. Well, we had tribal members who were now hired to be organizers. And so they ended up delivering water and food to families who were suffering from COVID. And what a statement that made, that we're not here just for elections, but we're really here to build a stronger community. And I was thrilled to see that, you know, voter turnout increased 38% in the tribal lands. Um, voter protection, you've all heard about Georgia and the amazing uh, work they did. We helped fund uh, their voter protection program and they have a, just an amazing story about an absentee ballot, but I wanna get to your questions. And then Texas did a great job. They are a long shot. They were our, we're, we wanna invest in them and see what happens. And they did a, uh, an amazing job building a model that helps them increase voter turnout by an, by an incredible amount. Unfortunately, the Republicans built or increased their turnout by that plus. So it's the only reason they didn't win. Um, so um, that brings me to my marathon, running through that very quickly question and answer. So I'm happy to repeat anything you want, but I just wanted to be sure that I left you a lot of time for questions. I'm gonna actually stop sharing this so I can see you better. So does anybody have any questions? Oh, there's all kinds of things written in here. <laughs> Yes, there are questions in the chat. So um, let's see, let me just go through some of them. That'd be great, Lisa, thanks. Yes, absolutely. Um, let me try to pull it up. Could, could I just interject just to yes. kind of go ahead. connect the dots go ahead. a little yeah. bit? Which So yeah. the idea is that we, uh, for Pennsylvania, uh, they're in the process of doing a proposal and that uh, you know, we, we can collaborate with Martha um, and her span and basically be a partner in helping to sort of totally turn around in my view, <laughs> the way they do organizing and, and in a very positive kind of way. Exactly. And, uh, you know, my sense is that, you know, the, the amount of money that they're going to be asking for is between a million and a million and a half dollars. So, uh, you know, I don't know how much of that we can do. I know Martha can get other donors, but I think, you know, we, we could, take a, a significant chunk of, of that and uh, do it, you know, we wouldn't do it overnight, but, um, you know, we, we could really move in the right direction in Pennsylvania. Just, just to give you a framework, if you're kind of wondering like why people don't do this, when I came in to Wisconsin being chair, it w I had $750,000 budget for the entire thing, for my executive director, my comms, my compliance, everything, $750,000. And, uh, and, I had to raise it all. So the former donor left with his donors and now Martha go out and raise $750,000. And I'm like, where the heck am I? <laughs> like, you know, that's a huge lift. So it's not that I didn't want an organizing program. I actually did have three organizers, but, um, but it, it's just a very difficult thing. So for us to come in and say, what do you want? Would you do this? Yes, you would. Why aren't you? Because I don't have the money. If we get you the money, will you do this? You have the power as donors to actually stabilize, to go from the roller coaster that Jim and Lisa were talking about to the plane. You, the donors, can stabilize this by saying, if you do these best practices, we'll fund you. You know, and then that will stabilize it, even when there's transition to new staff. So here are some questions. Um, there are a couple questions that just I think people are curious. Did Howard Dean, did Beto O'Rourke use this kind of model? Is this the kind of model that they've used? So Howard Dean back, um, I'm not sure. He did not have a year round organizing program that he was pushing when he was the chair of the party. But what he did, he really believed 
in, uh, hang on a second, I gotta admit someone who's coming in. Um, he really believed in, in, in state parties. When he was chair way back in like 2004, 2005, he gave $25,000 a month to state parties. When I first became a chair, we got $7,000 a month for state parties. So, so you literally have to raise all of it. But I know uh, I sit with uh, on the DDX board with Howard Dean and uh, he is super excited about what this is. And then he's like, this is the grassroots organizing that we should have in the state. Wonderful. So I guess another question in terms of our intersecting with you, people are wondering, so what is the role of outside state groups or outside state volunteers? In other words, this is an on the ground, permanent year round organization. What about people like us who wanna come in and help those volunteers and help knock doors and help do things on those teams? Is there any way to intersect with Absolutely. the Absolutely. So when COVID happened, it was super easy because we were only doing uh, phone calls, right? So everybody could get involved. Um, the one thing that we do, I do remember when Alabama was having one of their elections and we were all leaning in on the Alabama election, we learned very quickly that if we didn't have the right uh, accent in our voice, it could cause us to backfire. So state parties do make a decision on who they want involved um, with boots on the ground. But I know Ben had many, many volunteers coming outside of the state of Wisconsin. You would end up connecting directly with Jason, their volunteer coordinator, and they would help to coordinate what you would be doing. And you know, um, Pennsylvania is a great state to do that in. If we were going into Georgia or um, some of the Southern states, we just gotta be careful <laughs> that we're not going to cause more trouble. Right. Uh, people are curious, are you stretching into North Carolina yet? Yes, yeah, so North Carolina is a little ahead of Pennsylvania right now. So um, I've met, I have, uh, North Carolina has raised $500,000 for their program. I think, don't, I'm gonna knock on wood right now. I don't wanna jinx it. I think we have a, another 300,000 that we've secured for them. So this is a perfect example of why SPAN is so important. Meredith to Homo, who is the chair, the executive director there, she gave me a plan that only had five organizers in it. And I said, you really only want five organizers for all of North Carolina that you're gonna have them do all this. And she's like, well, Martha, I can't raise this much. I'm like, how many do you need? And she said 10. And I'm like, okay, I want you to give me a plan with five. And then I want you to say there's an add on because I really would like that extra. So it's 1 million with five organizers. It's 1.25 million with 10. She's going to get her 10. She thinks that now that she has that 300,000, she said, I can get a matching grant and I, we're gonna hire 10 Martha, which is a huge win because if you divide the state up and then you only have five, when I would go add more, cause I didn't have any more money, then you get your, your grassroots are upset going, Martha, we just got to know Joe and now here comes Andy. Like, can't you make things consistent? <laughs> I'm like, I'm just trying to get more help, right? But this way we hire right from the beginning with what we need. And again, that's by the power of wonderful people like you that are willing to help us fund these things. I mean, it just reminds us of just that idea that you can't accomplish anything where you don't have a goal to accomplish it. Yes, yes. And you state parties, honestly, I will tell you, it was so frustrating as a business person coming in going, why are we budgeting? Why are we doing this based on the budget? It should be, what do we need to accomplish? And then we create a budget and then we go raise to that budget. But instead, and it's not because these people are stupid or they don't understand. There literally was no avenue to get money to state parties. It's this theory of state parties were bad. And so therefore they just couldn't get the money. And I said, well, we've got to hold ourselves to a higher standard. We've got to talk to our investors to be sure they know what they're getting. And then we can raise that bar and we'll all work together to build you know, what we need to win, not just the presidency, but everywhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have a lot of questions basically about where else are they doing this? Are they doing this in uh, West Virginia? Are they doing this in Georgia? Are they doing this in Arizona? People are just wondering, you know, how is this being translated in different states? So Michigan is the only other state I know of that is really full every county wide. Wisconsin and Michigan um, are the two that are the strongest. 
Arizona uh, wants to do this, but again, it was a it was a big. They started with their tribal. They were like, okay, let's do the tribal first, and they were really focused on that. North Carolina is launching it. Florida had had a has had a transition to a new chair and a new ED, um, and I have heard from them that they want to do this. So I am actively saying, when do I see the plan? When do I see the plan? Um, but they are in that mode too that they have to hire all these positions first, like the higher level positions. So they're really rebuilding their party right now. And again, my hope is that in the future, we won't have that big of a changeover because we'll know that we have the right people in the right positions and we don't have to recreate the whole wheel all over again. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's very exciting to see. I'm hoping Texas is going to um, be uh, doing some more programming. So we're, we're working on that. It's a matter of how much money we can build or raise and then we can build. And are you intersecting in particular with the Georgia Democratic Party? Yeah. Someone here has said, um, we've heard, we know that that party is well organized. Are you working with them? Yes. So Scott right now has the president coming. Every, every time I contact him, he's like, now we've got, you know, there's all these challenges going on in the court to our voter rights, Martha. I can't talk to you right now. And then it was, it was the elections first. Then it was the voter attack. Now the president's coming. And so he said, I'll get back to you. So uh, Scott is a huge supporter of SPAN. Um, he uh, tells everyone that without SPAN support, the voter protection, I got to tell you the great story. I talked to their voter protection person and she was telling me everything they did. And she ended with this. I'm like, honey, that's your lead. Excuse me. I did say, honey, I shouldn't say that, but I said, that's your lead. That's what you need to talk about. She came in and she developed a relationship with the secretary of state's office, a Republican. And, but she came to the meetings and she became you know, friendly with these people. When COVID hit, she had been working on creating a new absentee ballot application using best practices from one of the agencies that provides what are the best practices for applications. She ended up sending them it to them and they adopted it because they needed something quickly. So they adopted her program. Had we not had her in there to develop those relationships, it wouldn't have happened. So we work closely with Georgia. We love them. It's just they've been so busy. I haven't been able to talk to um, I haven't been able to talk to Scott uh, to get all the details. Do you reach out directly to different state parties or do you generally wait for them to contact you? So right, I wish, my dream is that we do this in 50 states and seven territories. My dream is that every state has a good comms director, we have good data access to them, that even if you can only win some cities and then you start growing, we're not gonna turn this country the solid blue we want it to be if we don't start working in more places. But at this time, I wanted it to be a success. So we started with nine states. This year, we may expand to a few more states. So we could add on um, Nevada, for instance. We don't have that state in our listing because, but it, you know, if it blossoms and all of a sudden we have a lot more money, yes, we will be reaching out to more and more states. And my goal is I would love to see in five to 10 years that we are here ensuring that every state gets a base if, if you do these key things, like you have to be doing best practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have a website, Span? I do not. See, the, the, <laughs> this is, you I have so many other things. to create your website? Maybe yeah, we yes. can also some volunteers. Yeah, so no, we don't have a website. Um, I've actually been contacted several times by the New York Times because people talking about it, and I've always refused because I don't want the attention to be on what I'm doing. I want the attention to be on what the states are doing. So there were some articles where people have referenced that there's something going on and that there was some donations happening, but we haven't done that. But um, I do have materials that I can um, share with everybody that kind of gives an overview and some of the goals that we're setting for this year. Okay, yeah, if you can send us the materials, we'll send them out with our newsletter. We'll just attach it. That sounds that would great. Be great. Um, just looking to see if there's any other questions that I missed, you can just unmute yourselves folks and yell it out. Somebody says you should have a master class in organizing, which you kind of do. Here you are, you're teaching us. Yeah, so Angel Montes, I wish you could all meet him. Uh, he's just, he was uh, born in Mexico. He's an immigrant here. He literally worked for the American Red Cross for like 15 years and he quit 
when Trump was attacking um, everything and he was worried, he jumped in and said, I'll volunteer for Hillary Clinton. They hired him as a field organizer. He was so overqualified, you can't imagine. And they dumped him into Wisconsin. And he just organized, oh my gosh, he was phenomenal, clearly, because he had all these skills. He is the person now that is going to be doing this training um, for any state who needs it and to help, he'll literally come in and do train the trainers. Wow, that's great. Lauren Howard, yeah. <laughs> What is the DNC doing about state parties or state legislatures? So the DNC has a thing called the Grassroots Victory Fund. They started it um, after 2016 and they raised a, a lot of money and they committed to us that they were going to give us $10,000 a month, which was a 33% increase almost what it was. Um, and then they also committed to giving out grants. So like Wisconsin got about $500,000 from them for the 2018 election. And I know this year, again, they were giving out a lot of grants. The issue here, and this is getting into some of the accounting of it, but the DNC can only raise federal money, which means they can only raise $10,000 per person. And in the past, now you got people are making a change that we are starting to see small dollar fundraising be huge and that the DNC has a wonderful small dollar fundraising program now. But it used to be that it was only large dollar donors could only give so much. And so there was only so much money there. Um, Jamie was a former chair. He was a chair of South Carolina's Democratic Party. He is a big believer in state parties. And I'm hearing wonderful things that he wants to do a lot of things, but none of that has kind of rolled out yet. We haven't, you know, the states and the DNC and their decisions on where money is going hasn't happened yet. Could I jump in to say one other thing about Pennsylvania, which is that they are ha they're having local elections this year. Mm -hmm. So they're having a primary May 18th and, um, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's judgeships, it's certain county uh, officials, mayors and that sort of thing. But it's, it's something that's very important to the party. And it's another, it's a way that, that, that we can sort of practice, if you will. If we can get things rolling, we'll have the ability to show whether or not this is actually working uh, in time for the November election. Over. Yep, agreed. I did want to share one other thing too, is we have found that there's a problem with the model in our uh, low income areas. So North Milwaukee, every single constituency went up double digits in 2018 with this program, every single one, except the black community went down double digits. And so immediately I said, Hey, you guys, something's going wrong here. And so we, we put together a paid canvassing program that was long-term just like this, except you would actually pay people to, to be ward captains and to go chat with their, um, knock doors. Um, we are looking at trying to do a test this year where we would do that in two, um, Michigan would really like us to do it in Detroit, just as an example, every single county in, Mo in Michigan increased Democratic percentage except for one, and that was the one that's Detroit, where Detroit is, and it's because of the turnout in the Black community. So Lavora there, um, who happens to be a member of the African American community, she's their chair and used to be their ED, she um, wants to do this program, and it would be a paid canvas where 15 hours a month you would go out and knock doors. So in, in three months, you'd get through your whole ward. But then the week before the election, so you'd do this three, four, five times before the election. And then when the election comes, you take a week off from your regular job. So somebody can have a regular job and just really care about their community. And then they would come and do doors round the clock. Well, not round the clock, but 48 hours worth of doors right before the election. So the cost of the program is about a million dollars um, per place, but we're going to try to test it and we'll have a control group and we want to really look and see if it's worth it if, it, if it works, because there are millions of dollars paid on paid canvases right before elections. I just personally think they're pretty worthless because you're just trying to find who's available that can do doors nonstop and they're not often from the community and it just hasn't been working. Have you raised um, some of the funds that you need yet for Pennsylvania for your effort in Pennsylvania? Are you on your way or you're just starting? We're just, we're just starting. So I know Pennsylvania has some of their own. And as uh, Jim mentioned, James, uh, Jason is getting us a list of exactly what they have and where they are at the, with the budget. I also am meeting on May 6th with some of our bigger donors to talk to them. And I know Pennsylvania is on their list. That's another good thing for me. It's sometimes people hear about one state, so Wisconsin or Pennsylvania, and they'll just pour money in there. And I wanna be able to say, hey, they've got what they need. We gotta go try to do this over here. So being able to be sure that we're not flooding one state and then not helping another. 
Mm -hmm. Deborah. Um, so the point you raise about um, the turnout in the, um, the black community, I'm wondering about uh, what kind of um, alliances, connections you're, you're building with the grassroots groups that are already there, you know, that yep. already have those kind of organizations in place, those networks in place that certainly can use the funding um, and they're working on issues um, as well as electoral, um, electoral work, you know, to turn uh, those, exactly. those issue people into voters and turnout. Um, so, I mean, the, the, imp the infrastructure is there, the funding is not. Um, and you know, that's what we saw in, jo in Georgia, as far as kind of what they were able to do with the infrastructure that already existed. Yep, which is, we, don't, we do not want to duplicate anything. Um, I know in Milwaukee, this has just been a nut that Milwaukee um, C4s and C3s, we just have not been able to, to, to break it. Um, it's just, we've had numerous uh, elections where our voter turnout in the black communities is going down. I think ours is a little bit different of a concept because it is that you're going to hire the same person to go out and do these doors around the clock. It's not that you're, we have a model there right now that does a great job of going out and talking to people, but they're giving um, people a, a job, but they're not going to the same doors all the time. So they just didn't have enough resources to do this over a longer period of time. So our our plan is to, it's, it's much like taking the volunteer program, but making it a paid job in the areas where we can't get resources. I will say though, the, the three-legged stool that Jim mentioned, that is one of my favorite things that in Wisconsin, we have really strong C4s and C3s and we have really strong candidates um, but we just, the state party was really weak and that doesn't work. And we need to be sure that, um, we need to be sure that we have uh, three legs that are all strong. And it is important that we always find out what the C4s and C3s are doing where legally possible and then not duplicate their work. That just doesn't make sense. George and Martha. Uh, yes, uh, Martha, um, you mentioned several different states that you're working in. And uh, I'm not sure you mentioned nine. Can you enumerate the nine sure. states for us? Happy to. So um, we worked in Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, Minnesota, Texas, and Georgia. And Thank we you. actually did, um, we had a donor that was really interested in Ohio. Uh, and we, uh, they put a, um, we put, a pretty good six figure check into Ohio's uh, Supreme Court, their court races. And they did extremely well uh, on their court races while they didn't do well on their other um, elections. But uh, you know, it was another um, point that some of our donors saw that, holy cow, look at that. Like we won more judicial races than we thought were possible. <laughs> and, and yet we lost the state. So I think there's a great opportunity there to add more states. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? You can just unmute and call out if I'm missing you. Oh, oh yeah, uh, Roberta. Hi, so, um, this is so interesting and inspiring. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, well, um, so one of the states we're looking at is Georgia. I've asked a couple of questions, but I guess, um, are you, with, in working with Georgia, have you helped at all with, in, in general, improving the organization of the party or encouraging them to improve their organization throughout the state? Or um, could you talk a little bit more about what you've done with Georgia? So the work that we did with Georgia was um, largely driven to voter protection, being sure that they had the tools like hustle peer to peer to be able to text people. Mm -hmm. um, we ensured that they had it early enough so that they, they actually in 2020, for the first time in I don't know how many years, more Democrats turned out for the primary than Republicans, which was largely due to, they said they texted every single registered Democrat in the state. So giving them the tools um, to do that. I do, I'm really anxious to talk to Scott. He is just so busy all the time, but I would, uh, I would just tell you, I'm going to be shocked if, 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 if Scott would say, I don't want a year round field organizing program. I mean, every he's wanted to do everything. I think capacity is the issue usually. So as soon as I connect with him, I will be sure that uh, Jim and uh, Michael know exactly um, what the results are, what he's told me. 
Well, and just one quick follow-up. Uh, as Jim Shelton mentioned, we've been talking to folks in Georgia and we, we, we heard that the DeKalb County Democratic Party is very, very well organized. And right. they turned out, one statistic we heard is that they, uh, they make up seven and a half percent of the Democratic voting base in Georgia, but they turned out 12 and a half percent of the Democratic votes in the elections. So they were held out to us as a model of organizing. And from what I've heard is other county parties and even the state party isn't as well organized, but just we've heard to count. I'm gonna find that out. Oh. I'm gonna reach out to that. And I will tell you that, um, you know, again, a state like Georgia, now they have had plenty of money now. <laughs> they got a lot of money recently, but back, you know, when this was first started and they were first doing this, they really focused on, we need to get to the voters who aren't voting and let register them and get them out voting. And more than we need to persuade people to vote democratic. Theirs was all about registering new voters and getting, being sure that voters who wanted to vote can get to the polls. Um, so I'm gonna be really excited to read his proposal this year because being that what happened right now, I'll, I, I would expect we're gonna have a field program and, and he does have a field program because I know the Biden team had a field program on the ground. The question is whether it's year round and he's kept people from it. Thank you so much. Jim, did you have any other questions? No, let's, why don't we move on to <laughs> thank so Martha if I can just So if I can just quickly say all of you, you are what really inspire uh, all of us is that you do this because you're not paid. <laughs> I'm paid to do this. So at least it's my job. And I can't tell you all the volunteers who work for us on the grassroots level and, you know, people like you who are willing to donate to help us change things across our nation, you're amazing. And thank you so much. And I would love to, you know, I'll definitely stay in contact uh, with Jim and Michael, but I'd be happy to talk to anybody else too. So thank you, thank you so, so much, much for everything you've done and for coming to meet us. Thank you. I loved it. Enjoy. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Well, I'm inspired. <laughs>